Hello, I'm Corey Hawkins and welcome to the first of three videos I'm creating with the intention of helping new gardeners learn how to make a garden plan. You ready? Let's go. So you've decided that you want to start a garden. That's great. You're going to need to make a plan and to make a plan, you need to do a little reconnaissance. What is this reconnaissance? First and foremost, I think it's important for you to determine why you're starting a garden. Your motivation for starting is what's going to dictate your goals and your goals are what are going to form your plan. Second, you're going to need to evaluate your resources. What do you have available to you to create a garden? What kind of obstacles do you have to overcome? Third, you want to figure out what is it that you want to grow. And fourth, you need to figure out how are you going to grow what it is that you want to grow. In this video, I will be discussing your motivation and your resource evaluation. In the second video, I will discuss how to plan for what you want to grow. And in the third video, I'm going to share my garden plan as a means for bringing it all together for you. Okay, let's get started. Okay, let's talk motivation. Why are you starting a garden? Your reasons could be as simple as, I just want to see what happens. I'm curious. That's great. That will dictate a very specific plan. Your reasoning might be your family eats a lot of vegetables, in which case you should be making videos about that. <laughs> anyway, um, maybe your family eats a lot of vegetables and you want a majority of them to be organic and you want to know where they come from. That's going to dictate a plan. Uh, your family eats a, veg a lot of vegetables and you're looking to save money. So your budget is your consideration and that's going to create a very different plan from the plan of eating all organic. Budget, budgetary considerations, hard to say. Um, maybe your motivation is that you can foods or uh, you make you know sauces or salsas or pickled things and you're looking to double down on your homemadeness by making homemade homegrownness. That's great. That's going to dictate a plan. Um, for me, I got started in gardening because honestly, uh, my husband and I had a conversation some 10 years ago uh, that went something like, we're both uncomfortable with the fact that um, we've outsourced our food production <laughs> so much so that we're heavily reliant on um, grocery stores for our food, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, until it becomes an issue. So my goal was to learn how to grow a lot of food should I need to feed my family. Um, and that my garden has been big, ever since, since the beginning. I don't necessarily recommend starting big, but I did and it was okay. Um, this year, my motivation is that I want to grow extra food in case our community has a need for food. Excuse me, because that's likely. <laughs> so there's that. So looking at your motivation is really gonna determine how much time, how much energy, how much money you're gonna put into this, how much thought you need to put into this. There's a huge difference between I'm just going to grow a couple tomato plants and I'm going to grow a crop of tomato plants, different, different things. So determine why it is and we'll start building from there. You're also going to need to evaluate your resources. So the number one resource you're going to need is a place to put a container full of dirt, whether it's a raised bed, whether you plant them directly in the ground, whether you do it in pots, you're going to need a space to put your plants. Um, when you are deciding what's a good space to put your plants, what you need to consider is sun exposure and accessibility. So over the next couple of days, hopefully we'll have some sunny moments here in Washington. We're having one right now. Um, five minutes from now, probably not, but whatever. In the next couple of days, take a walk around your uh, property and just to evaluate like, oh, look, the sun is shining there. It's 10 a.m by one o'clock it's gone or oh the sun is there all day long or the sun never hits a square inch of dirt on my property um while that's not ideal i'm sure there's ways to get creative about it so um look for where your sun exposure is uh, another important factor is accessibility is there water close by um your garden's gonna need water that's for sure I don't recommend putting your garden in a place where you're going to have to walk water in. I've had to do that and it's not fun. I don't recommend it. Um, but you know, water is a big deal. Um, whether or not you can uh, access your garden site with your wheelbarrow can be important depending on the size of your garden. Um, if you can make sure you can get your tools back there where, or wherever you have your garden that it's accessible to your wheelbarrow, your tools, 
some water. Um, power's not so much of an issue, so I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but something that to keep in mind is uh, it is advantageous to keep your garden in a place where it's part of your everyday life, uh, where you walk by it, where you can see it from your kitchen window. Um, something where it's in sight and in mind, because when you put things out of sight, out of mind, they tend to get neglected. So, and you may need to balance that. Maybe the only sunny spot in your house on your property is a place that's out of sight, out of mind. Well, that's really the best place to use. So if that's the case, either find a reason to put it into your regular life or, you know, set reminders for yourself to go check on your garden because you know, neglect is easy when you don't see things. It's kind of like relationships, right? Okay, so that is the majority of what you need to check out for your resource evaluation. My next video, I'll talk specifically about how to choose what to grow. Now, obviously, you're going to grow what you eat, what you like, what you are intending to use. Um, but each different plant has specific requirements for growth, when to start them, when to plant them, when to harvest them. And what I'm going to do is um, teach you all how to decipher a seed packet. Seed packets have so much valuable information on them, but unless you know what you're looking at, it's all Greek, right? So next video, I'll go over um, how to evaluate or how to uh, interpret a seed packet, and then talk a little bit about how to make accommodations for a few different plants, probably the, the more common plants, tomatoes, cucumbers, lettuces, carrots, things that people grow a lot of. If you have a specific um, vegetable you want me to talk about, please put that in the comments below. So thanks for watching. I hope that this was informative and gets you thinking about your garden. I'll be back soon. Uh, again, if you have any questions, let me know. I hope that you and your families are doing well. Uh, and if you're staying home, thank you for staying home. It's actually much harder than it sounds. <laughs> and if you're not staying home, you stay home, would you? All right. Thank you. Take care. We'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Corey Hawkins, and welcome to video number two of the new Gardener's Guide to Making Plans. Thanks for joining me. Uh, hopefully you watched video one and you've had a chance to... Um, evaluate your motivations and maybe set some goals as well as take a look at what kind of resources you have available to you as far as growing space is concerned. Today we're going to talk about seed packets and how to read them. By being able to read a seed packet it's going to answer the questions of how much space do I need to grow, when do I need to plant things, and how long will it take to harvest them. Good seed packets will also include information about fertilization and some seed specs, like how long you can keep your seeds and um, what the germination rate is. So let's get to it. First, let's talk about where do you buy seeds and what seed companies are good. The seed companies are good thing is, is kind of uh, debatable and a lot of it's gonna be based on your personal preferences and experiences and also how much money you have to spend on seeds. The first category of seed companies I'd like to talk about are the big box seed companies. Those are the seeds that you're going to find at Lowe's and Home Depot and Fred Meyer or the end cap of the grocery store. I often will buy these as an impulse purchase. I'm not going to lie. I impulse purchase seeds all the time. Um, the thing about these seeds is that they're going to be more affordable um, because they are kind of mass produced. Uh, it is debatable whether or not they uh, produce inferior plants because they are more affordable, but some people might say they do and question their um, GMO status. I don't know. Um, locally, we've got Ed Hume. He was a local dude. He uh, has written books. He has been a great contribution to the horticulture community here, and I like him, so I usually will buy Ed Hume seeds if I'm impulse purchasing. Lily Miller is also a pretty good seed. Um, both Ed Hume and Lily Miller have good seed packets and we'll, I'll explain what makes a good seed packet later. Um, Burpee is one, I think Burpee is nationwide and their seed packets <laughs> leave something to be desired. I'll tell you why again in a little bit. Um, but obviously I've bought them and they've produced, you know, what they've produced. Uh, the other category of, uh, seeds to talk about are the boutique seeds. 
The boutique seeds are seeds that you might find in like an upper scale gardening center. Uh, locally, it would be like a Mulbax or a Flower World or a um, McAuliffe's in Snohomish County, McAuliffe's Valley Nursery, I think. I like them, you should check them out. Um, but they will sell what are called like kind of boutique seeds. They are more expensive um they are almost guaranteed to be non-gmo seeds uh they're grown in smaller quantities which you know you would argue would make them higher quality and, um i use them i can't i'm not gonna lie partly because they come in very interesting varieties when you've been gardening for a while you get bored it's like you can't just grow a tomato you have to grow heirloom tomatoes and your heirloom vegetables are definitely going to be found in the boutique boutique seeds oh and they all have such lovely packaging so renee's garden is one i use seeds of change also produce starts and we'll talk about what starts are later um but look at the tan look like how cute is that it makes you happy right and that is a fine looking, oops, sorry, a fine looking broccoli picture. I'm just like, I love the packages and I'm a big sucker for a, a pretty seed packet. But all of these seed packets have a good um, amount of information about the plant, except for the seeds of change one. So, um, but Renee's Garden and Botanical Interests are ones that I use quite a bit. But the seed company I use the most is Territorial Seed Company. And if I haven't sold you on a Territorial Seed Company seeds by the time we're done, then I have failed. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about Territorial Seeds and we'll take a look at their seed packets now. Okay, so we're going to start with this tomato. It's a Candyland Red, which is a cherry tomato, effectively. Uh, it's by the Territorial Seed Company. Um, Territorial does not put pictures of the actual plants on their packets they do like a generic plant for the plant family um but they have these beautiful illustrations and the illustrations on their uh the seed catalog covers are gorgeous but anyway i digress um i really like that territorial puts a good description of this plant on it it uh describes the flavor and it kind of describes the uh, nature of the plant like how it says in the last pair or last sentence that it tends to set its fruit on the outside of the plant for easy access which is great that's a good thing to know um, you'll notice in the upper left hand corner this 55 days uh, it might be obvious in some cases what that is but either way we're going to come back to it because i think we need to cover some other information first let's go to the back of the packet now and we'll start from the top you'll see that up here on top it says packed for 2020 that's good information to have because seeds are usually only good for two to three years uh, once we hit that fourth year we'll probably want to get new seeds if we haven't used them up already then we'll go down to the bar of information and we'll start with seed depth it says one quarter inch here which means you want to plant the seed one quarter inch below the surface of the soil Next, we'll look at the boxes entitled Soil Temp for Germination and Days to Germination. So the temperature needs to reach a specific soil for these seeds to open up and allow the roots and the plants to come up. That is called germination. When the plant sets roots and starts to send up a, t a stem, that's germination. And the number of days to germination is the number of days between the day you put that seed in the soil and you soak it with water to the day you see the sprout come up. That is days to germination. Now let's talk about thin plants too. This is a very important thing to understand. So when it says thin plants too, this means that this is how much space you need in between plants. So this particular plant says 18 to 36 inches. So that means between every tomato plant in either direction, there needs to be one and a half to three feet of space. Next week, when I talk about my tomato garden, I'll help this make more sense to you. You can see it more visually. Now let's talk about sowing indoors versus sowing outdoors. Sowing indoors means that you're growing it inside, uh, inside your home or inside a greenhouse where the temperature is warm enough for the seeds to germinate. So in this case, the temperature be can get to 70 to 90 degrees. This one says to start seeds six to eight weeks before anticipated transplant date. So I will talk about what a transplant is in just a little bit. And then it gives instructions on how to take care of your seed 
indoors. It does not recommend sowing outdoors. There's a reason for that. In most areas of the United States, by the time the soil is warm enough for the seed to generate, the plant won't have enough time to fully come to harvest. So we start them early inside so that we can get a harvest in mid to late summer. The rest of the information on the packet, the growing tips, fertilization tips, and seed specs are all going to vary by the plant that you have. Next week, I'll talk a little bit about ro floating roll covers, mulches, and season extenders because those are important for things like tomatoes. So just bear that in mind. We'll talk about it. Uh, fertilization is not something that I'm going to get too much into right now. Maybe I'll produce something later on that could help that out. But in the meanwhile, you've got this great information on this packet right here. Uh, as far as seed specs go, you can see the minimum germination standard is 80%. That means eight out of every 10 seeds that you plant will germinate. And the seed life is three years. That's about average. Okay, now let's go back to the front of the packet up in the corner where it says 55 days. That means 55 days to maturity or 55 days to harvest, or when you can first pick food from your plants. Now for tomatoes, that 55 days starts when you put your transplanted tomato into the ground, not from when you plant your seed. Okay, so what is a transplant? A transplant is a plant where the seed has germinated and has grown to the point where it can be moved outdoors. The size of the plant is important in making that decision and the temperature outside will make a difference there. So these plants are tomatoes, these ones here, and you can see that this plant has two different types of leaves. This leaf is what's called a seed leaf and it looks very similar in shape to the seed that was planted here for this tomato. And then there's these leaves, which are its true leaves. So for myself, when I am to transfer or transplant a plant outside, I wanna make sure that the plant has at least two sets of true leaves. That's just me. Um, for tomatoes, another very important factor is um, the temperature it is outside. So I won't put my tomatoes out until the beginning of May when it is consistently 50 degrees or warmer in the nighttime. So that's what I would consider a tomato transplant. I want to take over here, look at these um, zucchinis real quick. <laughs> these zucchinis were planted at the same time, but zucchinis are very prolific plants. They grow very quickly. You can see with these, this is the seed leaf. It also, it just looks like a very large version of the seed that was planted. And then these are its true leaves. And you can see that it's got its second set of true leaves coming up. But because of the size and the, um, the, the bulk of this plant, I would be willing to put it outside at this size, but the temperature for me is still too cool. We need to get a little bit warmer and I'll probably hang on to these for another two to three weeks. Okay, I've, I've picked a handful of plants that I'm gonna go over the seed packets with you and show you how I would glean information from these. So this first one is a carrot. Uh, from the front of the pack, it's a good description there. I can tell that it's 55 days to maturity and the plant size is seven to eight inches. That to me is the most important information. On the back side, I can tell the age of the plant by its pack date, so these are new seeds. Looking at that bar, I know that I have to plant the seeds a quarter inch deep. The seed spacing is that I can plant four seeds per inch. Um, that the soil temperature can actually be pretty cool for these plants to germinate between 45 and 85 degrees. That's a huge range. And so this could be considered a cooler crop. You can plant them earlier. Now this is soil temperature is the temperature of the soil. Don't confuse that with the temperature of the air because the soil tends to be warmer than the air. It can um, hold heat for longer periods of time. So yeah, you can use a thermometer to check the soil temperature, but even right now, it's the beginning of April in the Pacific Northwest, it is perfectly fine for you to plant seeds for carrots right now. Um, this shows days to germination is six to 21 days, 
and to thin plants from one to three inches. And now let's talk about what thinning plants means. Okay, what is thinning and why do we do it? Why is it necessary? So thinning is when you have too many seeds that have germinated and sprouted in one space where this cannot sustain that many plants. It just, you know, one of these plants is going to become dominant and you can see that actually happening in this case. This is the plant that's gonna survive. So why did I plant two seeds in here? Well, first we have the germination rate. So if I put one seed in every pot, there is a good chance that I'd have two empty pots based on an 80% germination rate. So now I know if I plant two seeds in each pot, there's going to be at least one plant per pot. Now with tomato plants, I can thin them by actually digging them up, and I don't wanna do it right now, but you dig them up and very gently pull them apart, and then I could plant these in two separate pots. Now I've done that with these over here, and you can see these are the same age as these, but because I have given them their own pots and I've also fertilized them, they've gotten much bigger. So, and the same will happen for these. So I will take these apart soon and put them in their own pots. Um, but there are certain plants that you can't do that with. Now, I don't have an example of it right now, but um, a lot of root vegetables like carrots um, are, you can't really uh, thin them by pulling them up the roots apart and replanting them. So for carrots, what I would do is I would choose what I thought to be the puniest of the two and thin them by cutting. So I would actually cut that plant off because yeah, root vegetables, if you pull the root up and then you replant it, it just does not work the same way as it would with like a tomato or a zucchini. So I've got two zucchinis coming up here and all these will eventually get their own pots. I've got some peppers. These are little peppers. Um, these are cabbages. These need to be, uh, this one might get pulled up, but these need to be, I'm just going to put these straight into the ground here in the next uh, week or so because these are cooler crops. They can stand being outside better um, at this temperature. And uh, yeah. Oh, here, one more thing I'll show you. And look at these. I've got some uh, snap peas growing. These were grown at the same time. They were planted at the same time as my tomatoes, but snap peas grow very quickly, which makes them great. I mean, they will produce peas very quickly and everybody loves that. So anyway, there's a little a couple looking at some plants in there. Where it says to sow outdoors, it gives you dates, which are really great. So, you know, from mid-March until mid-July, uh, you can grow your carrots. And it also says that the carrots will are slow to, and erratic to germinate, which is very accurate. Um, you can plant a row of carrots, or I've had the experience where, you know, a couple come up right away, and then a couple more come up a week later, and then a couple more, you know, and then and sometimes it takes, in my experience, longer than 21 days for the carrots to germinate. Then we have this great growing tip. It says till or spade the bed deeply 12 to 16 inches to allow roots to elongate and develop to their full size. So if the ground that you're planting your carrots on is too solid, you're, it'll stunt the growth of your carrots. They need to be able to grow to at least, this one is seven to eight inches, um, but it also will have a tap root, which is just a long skinny root. You can see it in the drawings of the um, carrots there that will go down much further than seven to eight inches. So it's important to make sure that your soil is loose and that your plant has the ability to grow very deeply. There's also good fertilization information um, and the, uh, the insect prevention is also really great information. Next week I will talk about um, the uh, floating row covers um, so you'll get that information. And then obviously there's these seed specs uh, and, you know, the 75% germination rate is good to know because, you know, when you start looking, you're like, wow, I thought I planted way more seeds. Well, yeah, you did. You planted 25% more seeds than what actually came up. And it also says here that the seed life is three years. So in 2023, I might be the, you know, as time goes by, the seeds become less and less likely to germinate. So that German ra germination rate goes down as the seeds get older. All right, let's take a look at this cucumber. What's the first thing I notice on the front of this packet? Well, 
I noticed the 51 days to harvest because I like plants that are able to harvest quickly. That means you're going to get more out of them in a uh, growing season, which is great. Uh, it's also a big plant to uh, 12 to 13 inches is a nice big cucumber. Um, what I noticed from the back is it was back in 2020. It's a brand new plant or brand new packet. Um, the seed planting depth is half an inch, mostly because it's a very large seed. Uh, the seed spacing, and then you also see over the thin plants too, refers to hills. I don't grow mine in hills. Um, I grow mine up trellises, uh, something I'll talk about next week. So the seed spacing I usually do is um, like 9 to 12 inches between each plant because they get pretty big. 12 inches is probably for this one because it produces such large plants, um, large fruits that it's, uh, I would put them at least that far apart. These cucumbers can be sown indoors and it says to do it three to seven, seven weeks prior to the anticipated transplant date. Now I do want to stop here and talk about transplanting cucumbers really quick. Cucumbers are a plant that are susceptible to root shock. So let's take a second to talk about root shock. Okay, so for plants that don't like to be transplanted or are susceptible to root shock, you can get these peat pots. And what you do is you plant your seeds directly in them. They germinate in the warm temperatures of your house or your greenhouse. You let them grow a little bit until they're ready to be transplanted. So they've got, for me, it would be for me, I'd do at least two sets of true leaves. We talked about that earlier. And instead of taking it out of the pot to put it into the ground, you just bury the whole pot and it will decompose as it gets wetter and wetter. And therefore the roots don't get disturbed when it gets planted. It, they, you know, they're able to just kind of do their thing in place. Um, the only thing about these is that you need to make sure that for the first couple of weeks, those plants stay very wet because if this stops decomposing, it will cause uh, the roots to kind of bind up on themselves and you'll have a root bound plant and that won't be as a successful plant. So there's that. Okay, so it says you can uh, sow your cucumbers outdoors. Um, the soil temperature above says 65 to 90 degrees for germination, but this says you wanna wait until it's at least 60 degrees um, to avoid cool weather that will be conducive to powdery mildew and I'll talk about powdery mildew a little bit next week because that's kind of a big deal here in the Pacific Northwest um, and then it again it talks about the spacing of hills I, I don't do hills so there's that um, mulches and roll covers we'll talk about it gives good fertilization information um, and the insect prevention is something we'll talk about as well Butternut squash is one of my favorites. It is a winter squash, meaning that it is. Uh, it usually has a very long days to harvest time. You can see 105 to 110 days is twice as much as the cucumber. Um, it's just the way it is. They're bigger, they're meatier, they just take longer to grow and, and ripen. They usually ripen in the fall, um, and that's why they're associated with fall. Great thing about winter squashes is that they keep well. So um, there's something that you can harvest in the fall and, and hang on to for quite some time, depending on how you store it. It could, you know, potentially store for months, which is what makes it kind of a good uh, crop for having winter food. Um, let's see, what else do we see from this packet? The seed depth there is one and a half to one to one and a half inches deep. Also, they're big, nice, big seeds. They're also grown on hills. I grow mine on um, a trellis. I'll show you that trellis next week and I can grow a lot of food on that trellis. Um, five to 10 days to germinate. Uh, soil temperatures a little bit on the warmer side, but once the, they germinate, they can tolerate cooler temperatures because they do grow into the fall. Um, you can grow them outdoors. I've had a lot of success with, with planting them both inside and outside. And I usually do both because that creates what's called a succession crop. And I will talk about succession crops next time. Um, you, so here it says with the growing tips that you do need to bear in mind that these are pollinated plants. So they need, um, uh, a male and a female flower and that's how they produce fruit they need pollinators um, there's ways to pollinate your plants um, by hand 
uh, that's definitely not something I'm getting into right now, but understand that, you know, that these plants will need to be pollinated in order to produce fruit. There's some good fertilization information. Um, yeah, it looks the, the standard seed life is a little bit longer. It's three to four years for this uh, winter squash. They tend to be hardy plants. They produce hardy seeds. Okay, so here we have an arugula. And I'm just gonna use this as an example for a, a leafy green because most leafy greens grow very similarly, except for kale, but uh, arugulas and, and lettuces are, are gonna kind of look the same. But arugulas, it's a, it's a little spicy green and it's delicious. Anyway, um, so what do I get from looking at this packet? It's a very quick time from seed to harvest. So this is a direct uh, sow plant for the most part. You can start them indoors. There's information about that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but these, these you consider from the time you put them in the dirt uh, until the time they are harvestable. Uh, is 30 to 40 days. That's really quick. Um, contrary to what you might think, when you harvest leafy greens, you don't necessarily pull up the whole plant. You just start cutting off the outer plants. And as long as it doesn't get warm enough or the circumstances don't arise so that that plant wants to go to seed, which is a whole video onto itself, I suppose, um, that plant will continue to produce leaves for quite some time. So that's one of the things that makes leafy greens real great is that you can just keep cutting off the leaves and making yourself one salad at a time and that plant will keep producing for a long period of time. Okay, um, what do we see? Their uh, seed depth is one quarter to one half inch. There's very small seeds. Talk about seeds facing below um, 50 to 70 degrees for uh, germination. So uh, it's a cooler on the cooler end of the germination scale. So you could probably put your seeds out for arugula right now. Um, two to 15 days, days to germination. And then you thin plants, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, every six to 12 inches. So, uh, sowing indoors, <laughs> I always laugh when I see that they put the seed, the sterile seed mix. Hardcore gardeners use sterile seed mix. I just use dirt. Um, I, maybe that affects how well my plants come out, but they're, they're fine. Um, and so it gives you instructions there on how to start them indoors and bring them outside. I have some of that happening in my greenhouse now with, um, uh, butter lettuce and romaine. Um, and then it gives you the, the information for sowing outdoors. Um, yeah. And it's, it says under growing tips at the very last sentence. So, so every couple of weeks for a continuous supply of young plants, that's called succession planting. And we'll talk about that. And, uh, yeah, so there's a little, uh, arugula for you. Okay. So this last plant we're going to talk about is a zucchini. I love a zucchini. It's a summer squash as opposed to a winter squash. It's days to harvest are quite a bit faster than the butternut squash we talked about earlier. And so we see it's 50 days. Um, zucchinis are mostly transplanted. So that's 50 days from the transplant date to harvest. You can see on the back there, the seed depth is similar, one to one and a half inches, because it's a big seed. Um, again, I don't use hills. So I looked down where it says sowing outdoors and it says space plants three to five feet apart in a row. Now that is what I would do. Um, I usually do mine about three feet apart. Zucchinis can be very large plants. Um, their soil temp for germination is 65 to 85 degrees. So it's, it, it's in the mid range. It's not warm. It's not cool. It's kind of a mid range deal. My zucchinis, I planted these Emerald Delights in my greenhouse. They came up seriously in three days. They were so fast. Um, yeah, these are also plants that are going to require pollination. If you find that you don't have much for pollinators, you might need to look up how to uh, pollinate by hand. This does give, um, bee attracting flowers that you can plant. I always have uh borage in my, in my garden because well, I think it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I think that everybody should be growing zucchini this year because it's a highly prolific plant. And the Snohomish Food Bank says there's no such thing as too much zucchini, but I can grow too much zucchini and now they can have it. So um, there is that. Okay, so why do I choose territorial seeds? Primarily because of the packet. 
I know that every time I buy seeds from Territorial, they're going to come in a packet that's going to give me all of the information I need to successfully grow that plant. So that's a primary reason. Uh, another reason is my experience with them um, is that they usually perform better than expected. So uh, this year I grew tomatoes. I grew, so far I've grown four varieties of their tomatoes and I've gotten 100% germination rate on all but one of them and that one was 90 percent and what they say you could expect is 80 percent so i got better than what they said i could expect and that has been my experience with them for years um, i also know from experience that they cre create um, the seeds produce healthy strong plants that are productive um, and consistent so it's not like i plant seeds i get four come up and one of them is good and the other one isn't. I mean, they're all very consistent, very productive, very healthy plants. Um, another reason I choose them is because their website has got a ton of really good information and it's um, very user friendly and I like that. I think that it's generous of them to, to create that information. A lot of seed companies do have that on their website. So, I mean, not just territorial, many seed companies websites can be a wealth of information for you but I like territorials and um, I like the customer service. One time I had a $120 order that didn't show up and I was like, well, you know, the delivery thing says it showed up and I didn't get it. And they were like, okay, well, we'll send you more, $120 more. Well, it turns out a couple months later, I found out that that package had been stolen and I'm sure whoever stole it, that young lady, I know she got caught was like, what am I gonna do with a hundred? She probably thought it was just crap. She didn't realize a hundred and twenty dollars worth of seeds. But I digress. I say that to say their uh, customer service just was like, "All right, you say you didn't get it. Here's more." <laughs> so anyway, so that's why I choose them. But there are plenty of other really good seed companies out there. Feel free to explore and have fun, and just you know make note when you use them. Like, oh, I planted four seeds and only one came up, or oh, when I use that, their plants are kind of puny, or oh my God, their plants are huge and luscious. So just think for yourself and figure it out. But if you don't want to do that, then you should just use Territorial. Okay, so now you've got all that information about seeds. You may be thinking, I don't have any place to start seeds. Okay, the things that you can sow outdoors to begin with, like, you know, the lettuces and the carrots, and root vegetables that's great you just put them outdoors but maybe you don't have a place to start your tomatoes that's fine you can buy starts um the thing that you have to become concerned about when you buy starts is who are you buying these starts from because seeds generally if they're non-gmo they're going to produce a nutritious chemical free plant if they have been started by another company, you don't know what they've put in their uh, fertilizers, you don't know what kind of pesticides that they've used because greenhouses can be a, uh, a petri dish of bugs and pests and molds and all kinds of stuff. So um, that's something to take into consideration. So you want to look for things that are organic. You, you know, if you can buy from probably the boutique shops are going to have nicer uh, starts or healthier, more organic, things of that nature. So that's just something to keep in mind. But it definitely, if you can't start seeds of, of your own, just get starts. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, well, I think that's enough information for one day. Here is all of what you know now. So you figured out what your motivation is, what your goals are. You've taken a look at what your available land resources are. Now you have a good idea of what you want to plant and you can start to think about how much space am I gonna need for that? How many tomato plants do I want? How many cucumber plants do I want? How many of this or that or the other thing? And now you can start to determine either how much space you need or given the space you have, what can you grow? So you've got the information to figure that out um, next week, I'm going to talk about more about where do you, you know the containers for your your garden, uh, raised beds versus containers versus straight in the soil. Uh, I'm going to talk about some other things related to growing um, row covers, uh, season extenders, and mulches, um, uh, supports for your plants, 
that kind of the structural information that you need to plan around. Uh, so that's coming up next week. If you have pl uh, questions, please post them below. Um, otherwise, I hope everybody's doing good. So far, we're all hanging in there. It is, it is, it shocks me. I'm an introvert and I love to be alone until I have to be alone. And now I'm like, oh God. <sighs> Anyway, I hope you guys are all doing good. I hope your families are staying safe and healthy. Again, if you're staying inside, thank you for staying inside. If you're not, then you should. Okay, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the third and final installment of New Gardener's Guide to Making Plans. I'm Corey Hawkins, and thank you for joining me. We have a lot to go over today. So in the first part of this video, what I'll do is I will share with you my garden plan and I will explain to you, go through the logic of why I have put what where. And hopefully that will make sense of the information that we talked about in videos one and two. It'll bring all that information together and hopefully have that more solidified for you, make more sense. Uh, in the second part of the video, I'm gonna go take a walk through my garden and I'm gonna show you the different structures I have in place what I use them for and why I think they're important. And hopefully that will be helpful to you. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, I just wanted to show you guys a quick overhead view of my garden so that when we're looking at the plants, you kind of understand what you're looking at. So my garden is like a big horseshoe shaped plot of dirt. Uh, there's some, uh, that circle in the center where I'm growing strawberries and that the rest is a, um, a gravel path. This is actually inspired by what's called a keyhole design. So feel free to Google that. But the idea of a keyhole design, it's supposed to be applied to a much smaller garden, let's say like a eight by eight or a 10 by 10, but it's where you access the center of the garden as a way of being able to harvest from all over your garden. You, you can access things easily. And one of the things we'll talk about later is accessing plants. But for now, just take a look. This is the size, the shape and all that good stuff. And now let's get to looking at the plants. So I apologize in advance if this is giving you uh, flashbacks to fourth grade overhead projectors in uh, 1984, but um, this is the easiest way for me to edit and so I'll get this video out faster and that's my all my intention. So what is it we're looking at here? This is a sketch of my empty garden. It is done on a, a dot, I don't know if you can see that. It's a dot grid paper, so it's like grid paper but you can only see the uh, intersected line or the intersections rather than all of the lines. And I prefer that because I find the lines to be a little bit distracting. Um, and so there's that, but if the line paper is better for you, then by all means do that. Okay, so where do I start? That's a lot of space, what do I do with it? Well, from video number one, I'm gonna go back and think about my sun exposure, all right? And so I know that my sun exposure comes from the south, this is south. I know from experience and observation that this area of my garden is partially shaded. This unshaded area gets sun from roughly uh, sunrise until about five o'clock in the afternoon. And then after that, it gets a couple of hours of what are, is called dappled sunlight. So it's, it's obscured, but it's not complete shade. Whereas this area from about 2.30 in the afternoon on experiences full shade, um, but has full sun before that. Okay, so what does that do for me? What that does is it lets me know that the areas that have full sun are gonna be more conducive to plants that like heat. How do I know what plants like heat? Well, we'll go back to our tomato here, where it says its soil temp for germination is 70 to 90 degrees. It's on the higher scale for germination. This is also going to tell you that this plant can tolerate and actually prefers warmer temperatures. So this is a plant that I would put in full sun. Now for the shaded areas, I wanna put in plants that can tolerate a little bit of coolness. They're gonna get some sun, but they're gonna have shade at the end of the day, which means their average soil temperature throughout the course of the day is going to be lower and that they're not going to get that really direct hot afternoon sun. So. Lettuce would be a good option for that. This is that, um, this is oh, romaine lettuce. 
and um, it can germinate at lower temperatures. I know from experience that uh, it actually does not like the hot temperatures. It causes these lettuces to bolt, which is a whole nother video, but if you wanna know what bolting is, you just go ahead and Google bolting. Um, but this is a plant that I could put in the more shaded area of my garden. Uh, I know that I can put brassicas in this area, so broccolis and broccolis, <laughs> broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower are all going to do well in this area. Uh, lettuces, kale, and anyway, I'll, I'll show you what I put in my shaded area. So that's that. Now let's look at it with plants. Here is my garden plan. It's got all the lovely things put in place. I like to draw my garden plan. It's part of my process. Um, but you know, that's not necessary. You don't have to make anything elaborate like this. If you want to sketch something out and just put circles where your plants are going to be, um, you know, feel free. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, there's also a lot of good online tools available for garden planning, but, um, I don't use them because just drawing it out is, is part of my process. Like I said, <laughs> Um, the other thing I failed to mention a little while ago is that the benefit of using a grid paper is that then you can create a scale. So you can say from one point to this point, that's equal to a foot. So my garden is equal to roughly from my neighbor's fence to the front here, about 29 to 30 feet. And at the very back here, this is 30 feet. Um, so now what I use those little, uh, that scale to plot everything out and I use my seed packets to figure out what to put where. So you'll see, this is the sunny area of my garden, the sunniest area. I have my tomatoes in here, potatoes. I like to just put some little flowers. Calendula is a lovely flower I like to grow. I just put them kind of sporadically throughout my garden. This is where my squash are. And I will take you outside in a little while and show you um, the, the trellis that I use to grow them on. This is my snap peas. I'll show you the trellis for those too. I've got beets. Now, uh, let's talk about this. So I have beats number one and beats number two. And beats number two are just straight lines. So that is where I'm planning to grow things in the future. I have beets planted now in these two rows. And probably about two weeks from now, I'm going to plant another two rows of beets. And that is what's called succession planting. And you'll see it in other areas too. I've got two rows of carrots and I have two rows of future carrots. I have one row of lettuce, one row of future lettuce, and so forth. Broccoli, I have another broccoli. I don't know if I'm going to do cabbage or broccoli in that row. We'll figure that out later. But I have an open row for succession planting. So, you know, don't necessarily plant all of your dirt, you know, full of seeds to begin with. You might want to uh, pace yourself. So let's take a second now and take a break and talk about what is the succession planting. I don't know if you can tell, it is really hot in this greenhouse. Like, but it's the only private quiet place I have. So I'm just gonna sweat through this. <laughs> anyway, okay, so let's talk real quick about succession planting because I've mentioned it a few times. And it is an important thing to understand because succession planting is what is going to guarantee you food for a longer period of time, that way you're maximizing the growing season. So we talked about lettuces earlier, we talked about that arugula, and that arugula has a pretty quick days to maturity date. It's 30 to 40 days so you can start to harvest. Um, when it starts to get warmer in the summer, that plant is gonna start to fail. It's gonna wanna bolt and go away and be like done with itself and it will help you to have another young plant ready to start giving you arugula. So what do you do? Plant a row, row of arugula today and say two weeks from now, you grow another one. Like you saw in my garden plan, I have, I plan for future planting space. And you can plan it so that, you know, the, you have your established row and they're gonna be full size plants. Well, you're, the, where you're planting, your future planting row doesn't necessarily need to be as wide because those plants are gonna start small, right? And as they get to be big enough to take that space, these other plants are gonna be ready to get pulled. So something to think about, or you can give them their actual space. Like they say to do this, however many inches or feet apart, let's just give this row that much space. Um, so that's one way to success, <sighs> succession plant. <laughs> I'm not retaking this cause I'm too freaking hot. <laughs> anyway, so um, another way is to do it by planting the same thing, but in varieties that have different days to harvest. 
I'm not sure if that came out right, but hopefully this will help. So this is sweet corn and I'm gonna grow some sweet corn in my garden. And it's three different varieties and they each have different days to maturity. So this bodacious sweet corn has 80 to 90 days until maturity. Then we got these sugar buns. I should have said these first. Sugar buns have 70 to 80 days and Golden Jubilee has 90 to 105 days. So I know that the sugar buns are gonna harvest. I can plant these all at the same time, which is what I'm going to do. I know the sugar buns are gonna be the first ones to harvest. They'll be 70 to 80 days. But then I'll get these bodacious ones some 10 to 20 days later, and then I'll get these gold jubilee ones 10 to 25 days later. So we're starting at 70 days and we're ending at the max of 105 days. So what's that? A 30 day span. You will have corn harvestable for 30 days. And geez, I hope that made sense because I'm not gonna say it again. Uh, a way to even extend that further would be to add the other type of succession planting where you plant all of these one day and then you wait two weeks and you plant a whole nother area of all of these and so that'll you know stagger out your harvest longer and longer and longer uh, at some point that becomes too much for my brain so I just plant these all at once I don't have a whole lot of experience growing corn so please don't ask me about it except that I can tell you how to succession plant it Whew, okay moving on Another topic that I want to dive deeper into is this concept of seed spacing or plant spacing or thinning plants to a specific space. Why is that the case? Why do we do that? And actually, I'm going to use these tomatoes up here as an example. Uh, the tomato packet that we looked, on and looked at in the previous video said 18 to 36 inches between each plant. Um, in my plant, I have about two feet. This is a four by eight foot hoop house, and we'll take a look at that later. And I kind of stagger these plants to create these triangles because it allows me to get an extra plant in there. So definitely play around with your spacing and have fun. But why? Why is the spacing so important? Why are these guidelines important to follow? So uh, number one is the size of the plant. So the tomato plants, they, I mean, I drew them tiny. They become very large plants. And if you plant two of them, too, too many of them too close together, if these plants are going to collide with one another. You may have it so that their branches crisscross and in the middle is where all your good fruit is, but you can't get to it without mangling your plant because the plants are too close together. So for just general maintenance, given the size of the plant, you don't want to have them too close together. It becomes dysfunctional, kind of like this quarantine. But anyway, um, the second reason is that you want to make sure that there is space in between these plants for airflow. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about later on in the video is um, fungal infections in plants. And airflow is a, uh, a tool in combating, <laughs> combating these funguses. So you wanna make sure that there's room in between the plants for air movement, it's very important. Um, the last reason is that if you have your plants too close together, they are going to compete for resources in a way that will end up killing some of your plants off or making it so that they don't, they're not thriving. So let's say you have three plants that are close together in a row. There's a good chance that the one in the middle is going to fail or not thrive because it's not getting the same amount of nutrition as these other plants. Um, you know, they're, they're the competitive creatures. They need water and they need food and they're going to do what they need to get it. And that might mean killing off some of your other plants. So the size of the plant, the air circulation and the available nutrition and water are why you need to keep, make sure that your plants are spaced out. Now <laughs> you'll notice over here, these are my squashes. They are not necessarily spaced very well. I mean, you're supposed to, it says to, you know, plant them at least three to five feet apart. These squashes are two feet apart. Now, um, the way I grow my squash makes it so that I can grow more of them in a smaller space. I grow them up a trellis because that takes care of the problem that the plant is too big and needs the space. It's getting space up above it on the trellis. Um, the trellis is also going to deal with the ventilation issue. The, most of the plant is going to be exposed to um, good ventilation and the uh, chance for fungal infection is then decreased. If I have a problem with uh, available resources and nutrients in the soil, I can 
act to mitigate that by fertilizing more often and making sure that these plants get extra water. So while the spacing thing is a, is a guideline, I think it's important to follow and understand. Um, there are circumstances where you can get more into a smaller space. Just kind of keep that in mind using the principles of, will this plant have enough space? Will it have good airflow? And will, can I make sure that it gets enough nutrients and water? So that is why understanding the plant space is important. Okay, this is a drawing for another uh, garden plan I did. It's not nearly as elaborate as mine, but that's okay, it doesn't need to be. Uh, this is Becky's garden. It is a 12 by 18 foot garden. And so this is all, it's about a foot, it looks like it's like a foot and a half deep, made out of logs, it's super cool. Um, but this is all filled in with dirt, okay? I know that the sun comes from this direction. This is south. And this is a full sun garden. So the first thing you gotta consider when you're looking at a plot that is just dirt is you, you need to make some plans for pathways. You don't wanna walk through the same dirt that you're growing in because your walking is gonna compact the soil and compacted soil doesn't grow food nearly as well as nice loose dirt. I mean, you don't want it loosey goosey loose, but you want it so that the, the roots can get find their way just fine and they have plenty of space to grow. So I started with creating like subplots by dividing it up with these pathways. Um, I put the taller plants in the back. These tomatoes are in the back because we don't need them casting shade. They have a lot of space, which is great. That way Becky is gonna be able to get back in here and around and get all of her tomatoes. Um, the smaller, shorter ones are in the front. I've got suggestions for when she plants them. Um, there's some squashes that are growing and some cucumbers and they this garden is gonna have a fence all the way around it. So these um, cucumbers and squash can use the fence for trellising and that's very helpful. And so, yeah, there's a lot of extra room in this garden. So Becky can go have fun. She can put in some marigolds or calendula or different herbs and forage and things that are gonna attract bees. She's got space for that. Or she can put in some garden art or her fairy stuff or whatever she wants. But this will be an easy to maintain garden given that everything's got a lot of space and it's nice and big and you've made allotments for how to get around. So that's an example of a different garden that I've, uh, designed using the principles that we talked about earlier. There really is no end to ways that you can lay out your garden. Things that you need to keep in mind are, what is the sun exposure? You want the warmer loving plants to be in the full sun area and the plants that can tolerate shade to be in the shaded area. Um, you may want to consider putting the taller plants in the back so that they're not creating shade for the plants behind them because all shade is shade and it will cool the soil temperatures. In some cases, you may have such a full direct sun area and you might need some shade to grow things like lettuces because they don't really like it too hot. So maybe you plant your you know row of tomatoes and you plant your lettuces behind it and then in the shade of the tomato. And then after that, there's more full sun and you can put your zucchinis there. So get creative. Um, I've had my garden space for 10 years. I've never planted it the same way twice. So. The other thing I will say about, you know, your garden layout is you might want to consider the aesthetics. Uh, I put flowers in mine. There are flowers that are uh, pollinator attractors. So borage is one of them. Um, I always have calendula in my garden because I like it. I always have nasturtium in my garden because it attracts aphids and bugs that would otherwise attack your plants. They like the nasturtium better. And what you do is you use that nasturtium like a trap. You just let them all cover it up. It's really disgusting. You wait until it's grown and then you pull it and you yank it and all those bugs are out of your garden like that. So, and it looks pretty. So think about putting, you know, garden art in your garden. I, you know, there's something about when something is aesthetically pleasing to you, you're gonna take better care of it. You're gonna be more proud of it. So get creative and have fun with your garden plan. Um, I keep some notes. I, you know, and when it comes to garden planning and note taking, I am not very good, but I keep basic notes. This is the original layout. This is the plants that I want in it. I put the date of when I planted them and how many, and I figure out how many by reading my seed packets. And, um, 
And that's pretty much it. I'll have a page somewhere in the back that is just notes of what worked and what didn't work. But that's what I do. You don't have to make a big deal of it. Or if you're a major planner and you love planning and 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 micromanaging then feel free to micromanage your garden i'm sure it won't hurt it's not going to hurt it it's not going to get offended like your coworkers. so that's regarding plant garden planning if you have any questions about that please post them below now we're going to go out into the garden and take a look at um, the structures i have in place introduce some new ideas and concepts and uh, hopefully learn some more stuff let's go All right, let's take a walk through this garden. I hope that this is not too Blair Witchy for you all. Um, I made a Blair Witch reference to my dad once and he didn't get it. I'm like, oh my God, there's that generation gap. But anyway, here's my garden. Uh, let's talk about what this is. So my garden, I said, was in a keyhole shape. It is a raised bed and I have, uh, it is a raised bed using stone. Okay, the benefit of a raised bed is that it allows for a greater surface area for the sun to warm. So it's not just warming the top layer, it's also warming the sides and the front, depending on you know the angle of the sun, etc. Um, that is going to cause the overall temperature of the soil in the container to increase because it is raised above and there is more surface for the sun to warm. The material you make it out of um, is going to affect how much warmth is retained in the soil. So if you make a raised bed out of wood, that's great. Uh, wood it will help heat that soil up, uh, but wood doesn't hold heat for as long. So as the temperatures start to drop, so will the temperature of the wood. It just doesn't drop as quickly as the air, or in some cases as the soil itself. So it will keep, keep warm for a longer period of time. Um, the reason I chose stone is because stone holds more heat and holds it for longer. So it just changes your average soil temperature over time. So, so there's that. Another good uh, option for growing in an elevated way are containers. Let's say you don't have space for a, like a traditional raised bed. Containers are just fine and they act the same way as raised beds do. They create more surface space for the sun to help heat the soil, especially the black ones on the right and the left. They're going to absorb a lot of heat. And all of these containers are an appropriate size for uh, growing things like zucchinis and tomatoes. You would probably only want to put one plant per pot, but if that's all you have the space for, then that's great. That'll work just fine. Okay, so let's take a look again at the garden. I think one of the things that's gonna stand out right now, especially since there's no plants out here, is that I have structures in place. And they all serve a purpose, and I wanna talk about them starting with the most obvious ones, and I think it's these uh, hoop houses over here. I have two different types of hoop houses. I have these ones that are covered with row cover, and I have these larger ones that, um, this one here is the trellis for my, uh, squashes and my pumpkins they just grab onto this um, fence and grow on up and then this one will be for my tomatoes and so let's talk about why do we have hoop houses okay what's up with these hoop houses why do we have them why do we use them so they can be used for a variety of things and they're called different things based on what you're using it for so there's these row covers which were the smaller hoop houses that you saw um, the reason I'm using a row cover right now is it still gets pretty cold at night. And so the row cover acts as like an insulator. So it lets the light through in the day and it lets that soil warm up. And then it, it creates almost like a, a greenhouse effect over the top of the, um, the row that I have planted there. Um, the stuff that I'm using is this, I don't know if you can really see it. It is a lighter weight row cover. Um, so it is permeable, it allows air through, which I like right now. Um, most of the stuff that I have planted outside can tolerate lower temperatures, so I'm just kind of adding a little bit of protection on it. Um, and so there's the, this kind of row cover. There's also this row cover that I use on my um, tomatoes. This is a six millimeter poly uh, plastic, and it is not permeable, <laughs> and it heats up, it gets hot. So during the summer, I have to kind of vent the bottoms to make sure it doesn't get too moist inside of my tomatoes, but it definitely warms up um, much more efficiently than this does. So these then would act as season extenders. Um, it means that I can plant, especially this one, um, I can plant things earlier 
and allow them to stay in the, gra in the ground longer into fall because, you know, I'll cover them up in the spring and let them open up and do their thing in the summertime. And then at the end of the season, cover them up again to help keep in the warmth and extend the season. The other reason that you use um, row cover especially is in plants that are susceptible to uh, insect infestations. Um, so the life cycle of an insect that would bother your plant, say like a carrot fly, is such that they need to be able to find your carrot, land on your carrot, you know, lay its little babies, and then the babies will grow up and become the problem, and then they feed off your food, and then they are healthy, and they take off, and they do the same thing elsewhere. So you could use a row cover to interrupt that process, assuming that you've done some crop rotation. Crop rotation is not something that I'm going to get into right now. And really, if this is your first year gardening, you should not have too many problems with um, insects uh, because they have to find you first. <laughs> it's really like your first year, you're kind of off the radar. Um, it's when you get second, third, fourth, fifth, the further you get along, the more likely you are to have to deal with things like row covers and inter interrupting the life cycle of the bleh, interrupting the life cycle of the pests that are going to get in the way for you. So, but just know row covers help with insects and they also help uh, it, um, extend your growing season. And the less permeable the substance is that you put on your hoop house or your row, the hotter it's going to get. And then you're going to also have to consider uh, air circulation. So that's kind of the gist on hoop houses. So you notice I have a couple of different types of hoop houses. I have this one and I have that one. This one is a lighter weight hoop house. I got it from um, gardeners.com. I think it's called Super Hoops. Um, they're lightweight. They're easy to remove and store. Um, they are a temporary row cover type structure. Uh, I'll probably take these out in June. These plants will be nice and big and you know the bug threat will have passed-ish. And so I will open this up and let them just be. Uh, this structure is more permanent. It will be up all year. And I actually use this space, this little space that's created. This is Trex decking. And so it hasn't, this is 10 years old. It, nothing has happened to it. It's held up really well. Um, but I'm going to fill up the space in here. And let me tell you how I do that. So you'll see I have this little snaky um, soaker hose in through here. And I've put this down. I'm not even close to finished with that. But over here, same situation. I have the sneaky uh, soaker hose underneath. But now I also have this layer of um, weed block or ground cover cloth. Uh, I put that down. And then on top of it, I put a, uh, a bunch of mulch. I haven't mulched this yet. This is actually from last year. <laughs> Should have taken it apart, but shoulda, woulda, coulda, didn't. Um, but anyway, so let's talk about why I, I do that. Why do I go through that? So what purpose does all of that serve? To have the soaker hose down and then the fabric on top and then the mulch on top of that? Well, the first thing it does is that it um, conserves the amount of water that I could use. When I am watering directly at the soil level and I have a level of like a layer of insulation on top of it, it's going to make that water stay in place for longer. I'm not losing it to evaporation. Okay. So that's the number one reason. Um, and I would also say, I'll, I'll come back to soaker hoses in a little bit, but soaker hoses are great in that they, they don't waste any water. When you're using sprinklers, it's a waste. So there's other reasons to use soaker hoses and timers, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But for now, just know that it conserves the water. What it also does is it keeps the top layer of earth in relationship to the rest of the plant dry. So by having that dry, you know, the fabric block and the dry mulch on top, it's going to make it so that any kind of fungal spores are not going to go up and do their thing. They're suppressed in that area because for fungus to occur, it needs moisture. And so if it's dry, you're going to have less fungus. You got it? Okay, so why should I be concerned about fungal infections? Especially if you live in the Pacific Northwest, you should be very concerned about them because they're, they're prevalent everywhere. Um, but for myself, I grow a lot of tomatoes and I grow a lot of squash, and they're both susceptible to different types of funguses. Tomatoes are susceptible to blight. You can get early blight or late blight, and they're also susceptible to what's called 
blossom and rot. Both of those diseases will render your fruits inedible. They're going to be funky and mushy and disgusting. You can't eat blossom and rot blight tomatoes. Squashes are susceptible to powdery mildew. And what powdery mildew is, is this substance that will coat the, your leaves. It turns them white and makes them crispy and dry. And it makes it so they can't photosynthesize. And then your plant becomes less successful. Now, it may produce less fruit. It may produce no fruit. It may be that you get it so late in the season that it, you can still get fruit and it'll ripen, but your plant looks like heck. It's not a good looking disease. It's not pretty at all and um, it can be potentially fatal to your crop. You can, there's, there's treatments for it. Um, I have always used the uh, diluted milk treatment, but there's no scientific evidence to back that it works, but I, it's worked for me for a long time, so you go ahead and Google that. Diluted milk, powdery mildew, works very well. Um, in the past few years, I have uh, moved over to buying powdery mildew resistant seeds. Um, they definitely do resist the powdery mildew, but it's one of those things here in the here in Washington. It, it, you're going to get it at some point. Big fan of soaker hoses. I have them all throughout my garden. You can see, and I can plant things on either side of them yeah, all around. Back in the tomatoes, Let's snake through here. Uh, this garden space is, I don't know, on average about six foot by 28 feet ish. And this is one 50 foot <coughs> soaker that I'll use. I have them all connected. I have a gazillion pieces to my um, irrigation system, but I keep this space clear over here for um, timers and such. So it's like, <laughs> oh, there's my big shadow. Uh, I got the water comes in from the house. It splits off in four different directions. And actually, one of those hoses leads to another timer. Uh, it's it's very intricate system. But I mean, if you've got a small garden space, you could probably get away with, um, you know, one 50 foot run. If you have more than one 50 foot, you want to have one 50 foot uh, run per timer because. It, if you try to connect your um, soaker hoses together, they'll lose pressure and they won't be as effective. All right, so now you've seen my soaker hose set up and timers and whatnot. Why bother? It is an investment. Um, you may be able to find some free stuff on Craigslist. Um, my irrigation, I call it Franken irrigation because it is like a monster with parts from all over. <laughs> but it works and that's all that matters. And, and why is it important? What mean, What do I mean by it works? What does it do to work? Um, first of all, it does conserve water. It's it's not wasteful. When you're blowing water out of your hose, it's some of it's, it's not all going to the soil and it may be contributing to problems with fungus, which we talked about earlier. Um, but it's, it's kind of wasteful. You want to water the soil directly. It also allows for, the timers especially, allow for consistent watering. So I know a lot of people want to go out and, you know, water their gardens. They find it very zen-like. That's great. Have a couple of pots of flowers <laughs> and water those. But in your vegetable garden, I highly recommend having timed water. Uh, if, for consistency, um, you, it's never going to forget unless for some reason the batteries run out. So check on that. Um, and it's, you're going to get the same amount every time. And then you'll know okay, well, the water, the area gets this much water over this much period of time, and oh, that stuff is looking a little soggy, you know, to scale back. If it's not getting enough because things are getting dry and crispy and looking kind of wilty, then oh, it's not, then you know to give it more. So it creates a good baseline for you. There's a problem with having inconsistent water. It is going to, in some cases, if you are lightly watering something and then all of a sudden you water it a lot, you're going to give it shock. So like tomatoes, for instance, will split if all of a sudden they get a lot of water. They'll be like, la, 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 oof, and they split. So consistent water is important. Timed water, like knowing you can count on it. If you need some Zen watering time with your plants, put some flowers in a pot or have a couple of uh, one area of your garden that you're responsible for. But otherwise, I highly recommend um, soaker hoses and timers. The timers that I have are made by Orbit. I think I might have mentioned that, but they are great timers. I've had them for a long time <laughs> and they've 
they've held up and they, and they do a great job. So that's my spiel on silver hoses and timers. So if you grow anything that vines like snap peas or cucumbers or any of the squashes, well, with the exception of zucchini, doesn't need it, um, you're going to need a trellis of some sort. So this is a pretty good trellis. I've grown quite a few um, uh, pumpkins and squashes up this. It's held quite a lot of weight. This is just cheap um, garden fencing draped over this hoop house that I actually used to use for tomatoes. Um, and it's cool. It creates kind of like a tunnel of... Um, of plants and it you know the the actual growing bed it becomes just this mass of green green and it's beautiful um this is what i grow my snap peas on this is called a teepee trellis and it was easy to make um you can use bamboo i like to use this it's like a plastic coated metal rod it's a little bit flexible but not very i've had these for years so the bamboo will rot over time these last for a long time um Another thing that you're going to want to consider, like right here, I don't know if you can even see that, is a tomato cage. This is going to be used in this space here for uh, medium-sized sunflowers, but I will have tomato cages set up in my tomato thing. You can see them laying on the ground over there. And so those are some things to consider for support structures. It's finally starting to cool off here in the greenhouse. Well, I think that's enough information for today, and hopefully that is enough information to get you started. It might be too much information. If it's not enough, please let me know. Let me know any questions that you have or uh, topics that I didn't cover, um, and I'm happy to help you out there. It uh, is important to me this year that people get out and start gardening. Um, our food supply chain is, uh, is vital to the stability of our nation, of our society, of humanity. And if you can be a part of making it more stable and, and healthier and more secure, then that is a, a fantastic thing. And I commend you for, um, for taking the interest and, and making the efforts. Uh, if you've watched this all the way through, thank you very much. Um, if it's not obvious, I have no idea what I'm doing with this whole video business. So uh, it's been a little painful, a little awkward and... Um, but I, I hope that it's been helpful and thank you for watching it all the way through. Um, I hope that your the remainder of your quarantine goes well. Who knows what this year brings. Um, but at least now you know how to grow some food. So until next time, perhaps, I'm Corey Hawkins signing out. Good luck. Good gardening. <laughs>